have a number of distinguished guests that uh, we're going to have a conversation with about um, the chances uh, and the outlook of Chinese films in the upcoming Oscars uh, awards. So we will be speaking on this topic of China cinema, its future uh, domestically, its prospects globally, and its international appeal, especially in light of four China-related films getting nominations at the Academy Awards. These four movies are Better Days, uh, a film that highlights school bullying in China. Uh, that's up for the international feature film category. Uh, the second film is Over the Moon, the Netflix animation about the goddess Chang'e in the best animated feature film category. Uh, Disney's live action Mulan is the third film we'll be talking about. Controversial popularity wise, but with nods for best visual effects and best costume design. And finally, Nomadland, making history with Chloe Zhao becoming the first Chinese and Asian, in fact, woman director to be nominated for best picture and best director. We have an amazing group of speakers uh, lined up for today. They will discuss some of these topics first with the Radii editorial staff before we open up the floor uh, for anyone with questions or comments. I'm going to let my editor now go into details about our speakers now. So please take it away, guys. Hi, uh, so my name is Brian, uh, Brian Rogan. Um, I'm standing in for Jake Newby today, but I'm the culture editor with Radio. So today we're really excited to dive into the topic of Chinese cinema with the speakers we have on stage today. Um, they're all incredibly knowledgeable about Chinese cinema and its relation to international box offices, and are all incidentally uh, contributors to a major project of ours, which is a list of 100 movies to understand China. Um, if you want to read that list, the URL is in my bio. So, with us today uh, are Chen Shoufan, uh, also known as Stanley Chen. Um, he is an award-winning science fiction writer whose long-form and short-form prose has been widely praised for addressing topics such as the environment, um, Chinese identity, and human behavior in a time of emergency. His works have appeared in many global science fiction magazines with translations into German, French, Korean, Italian, Japanese, and other languages. Um, hi, Stanley. Do you want to say hi to the room? Thanks, Brian. Hi, I'm Stanley. Um, thanks for having me and have this great opportunity to have a conversation with Michael, Samantha, and everyone to talk about uh, Chinese cinema. So, yeah, um, by the way, I'm reading, uh, speaking in images from uh, Michael, highly recommended. Thanks. Great. Uh, also with us today is Samantha Cope. Um, Samantha is a writer, producer, and creative strategist who has traveled extensively between the USA and Greater China. Her work examines the changing flows of global culture, emergent uh, creative economies, and mobilizing storytelling for social change. She produced the criminal justice documentary series, The Confession Tapes, and also Exhibit A for Netflix, and was a consulting producer on the global food series, Ugly Delicious. Hi, Samantha. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for having me. Also, I'm just a thrill to be on a panel with Stanley and Michael, two, two people whose work I read and learn so much from. Um, and yeah, so so excited to, to join. Thanks. Awesome. And finally, um, we also have Michael Berry, uh, who is the director of the UCLA Center for Chinese Studies. His areas of research include modern and contemporary Chinese literature, Chinese cinema, uh, popular culture in modern China, and literary translation. He is currently working on a monograph exploring the United States 
as it has been imagined through Chinese film from 1949 until the present day. Hi, Michael. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. It's a delight to be here. And I'm especially honored to share the stage with Samantha and Stanley. Actually, I see in the audience one of my former PhD students, Kara Healy, is here. And Kara is the one who first introduced me to Stanley's work. She wrote about his, uh, his novel Waste Tide in her dissertation more than a decade ago. And so it's kind of a nice symmetry that we're all here together. And I look forward to our conversation. Excellent. Um, so I suppose to start with, uh, just as an icebreaker question, um, so we, we spoke about the four general and films uh, which are up for uh, Oscars this year. Uh, uh, I suppose um, for our three guests today, um, are there any, any films that you particularly liked that are up for Oscars? Uh, whether they be chat related or not. Um, so maybe Samantha, do you want to kick that off? Um, sure. Um, I, I do. I like Better Days. Um, and I feel like I am so behind in general on, on, on viewing some of the newest films that are that are up in all the general categories. Um, but I, that, that's one that I enjoy. Awesome. Um, how about Michael? Do you do you have any particular films that you liked from from this list? Well, I will say that I think Chloe Zhao is just a force of nature, and uh, I have high hopes for what she's done and what she's doing and what she's going to bring to the future. Not only just for film, but I think for a long time, both Hollywood and China have been trying to make a film that could crack the code, so to speak. That is, make a film that will play well in China and also play well uh, in the West. And up until this point, I think most of the films that have come out trying to do that have been stuck in one mold or another. You know, you have a Chinese film and they throw in an A-list Hollywood actor like Christian Bale or Tim Robbins, and they hope that that will do it. And thus far, many of these films have not been able to crack the code. And I think what we really need are creative bilingual, bicultural individuals like people like Dan Ang, people like Chloe Zhao, uh, Kathy Yan, and I think they're really the future for what uh, global film is going to look like. And so I, I'm really eager to see what uh, Chloe does in her next acts as we move forward. Great. And, uh, and Stanley, from, from the four China-related films, uh, of her Oscars this year, are there any that you that you particularly liked from that list? Yeah, Echo with Michael, and Chloe Zhao, and uh, Nomadland, Daphne uh, Tinaunen, and I watch it and I love it and recommend to all, uh, a lot of my friends. And I think uh, in Oricoli is it really won an Oscar uh, for Best Picture or Best Director. So, and I think Better Days are also very strong and Pedro on a foreign language movie category. And also, I personally know uh, one of the script writers and uh, alumni of the university in the uh, literature department. So, unfortunately, uh, I hope I can go for the Oscar as well. Thanks. Excellent. Um, so, I suppose to move on and just to kind of like go a little bit deeper. Um, okay, right. And I'm going to just in relation. reset. Yeah, sorry, okay. just, sorry, sorry to jump in. I, I just want to do a quick reset for those who have joined uh, this group. Um, uh, in, ca in case you did, <laughs> in case you're, you're wondering uh, where you are, this is the China Clubs, and the uh, session is, uh, and the Oscars go to. Uh, China question mark. We have an amazing lineup of speakers uh, who are going to be uh, sharing their views on the potential of China getting recognized in the uh, upcoming Oscars awards, but also talking about Chinese cinema, its history, and appeal outside of China. Um, and one quick factoid for, for everyone, uh, just to give a little context to how the movie market is booming here in China. Ten years ago, there were only 
roughly 6,500 movie theaters uh, in the country. Now that number has hit uh, over 75,000, almost double that of the United States, which is about 41,000. So, um, sorry, Brian, to interrupt. Just wanted to reset the room. Um, and this room is being hosted by Radii. Uh, thank you. Let you guys continue. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is Brian Rogan. I'm culture editor with Radii. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, to move on to the, the next question, I guess uh, to build up, um, we mentioned earlier um, a a project that Radio had worked on, which was uh, a list of 100 films to understand China. And this list was broken up into uh, 10 different categories, which kind of addressed uh, different eras of Chinese film. And I. I wonder uh, for our guest today, when we talk about Chinese films, uh, we'll talk about the different eras um, of film. And so I wondered if if you have uh, a favorite era or if you think that there is a most important era of Chinese film and why. So I guess, uh, Michael, do you want to kick that one off? It's hard to play favorites, I think, you know, if you really want to understand the history of Chinese cinema, you've got to do a deep dive into all of these different eras and all of the different genres from, you know, the pre-49 period to socialist realist cinema to, you know, science fiction to genre films, the art cinema. I mean, I think you really need to dip your foot into all of these different, different areas. If I had to kind of look at the history of Chinese cinema from a macro perspective, I think we could really break it down in a somewhat vulgar way, but into three main periods. We've got post-49. And so you have a period of high socialism from 49 all the way to the late 70s, where film is heavily uh, guided by political motivations, guided by Chairman Mao's 1942 Yenan talks, very powerful ideological thrust behind these films. Um, and it might seem like ancient history to a lot of people, but I think you really need to be informed of that era to have a good grasp of what's happening even today in the world of Chinese cinema. Uh, in the 80s, we start getting you know the open door policy and all of these new works flooding in from the West, also a rediscovery of works from China's own film past. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very eclectic period because you've got the beginnings of commercial cinema coming back, you've got genre cinema coming in, a lot of foreign films, uh, but for me the big stamp of the 80s and 90s is the emergence of art cinema. Um, basically the fifth generation and later the sixth generation, I think you can even look at those movements as synonymous with the Chinese New Wave. This was the introduction of art and experimental cinema into China, and for me that's always been a uh, period I gravitate towards because of the artistry, the depth, the layered meaning that you can get out of those films. Uh, they're much, I, I enjoy teaching those films. Uh, you can go back and watch them over and over again. Um, and so that, that's a period that's always been close to my heart. And then over the last 20 years, we move into phase three, which is the juggernaut of commercial cinema, which has been and so when you I think originally when you posed the question you also asked about you know which is the best maybe era in some sense and, and I think it really depends on your positioning so if you work in the film industry for most people it's this current era because as you mentioned with the exponential growth of cinema chains and screens and box office revenue this is the period that's been most lucrative most exciting from a commercial perspective however I'm not sure if I would agree it's been the most exciting period from an artistic perspective and I think sometimes when the stakes are higher, cinematic works uh, fall back to a more conservative mode. And I do feel we're missing some of the experimentation and excitement and variety that we had in the 90s um, when, you know, say the sixth generation was really taking off. And cinema is also kind of losing its diversity. I think for a healthy film market, you need commercial cinema, but you also need experimental cinema, you need independent cinema, you need um, all kinds of different stuff and I think what we've been seeing is this lowest common denominator uh, with the commercial juggernaut just snuffing the life out of other smaller genres that really need 
more support to flourish and expand. Smaller like film festivals, 
and also films, uh, especially the documentary or experimental films, traveling through kind of like artistic spaces too, in like the early to like mid 2000s, um, at museums, biennials, etc. Um, being a, spa- a really welcoming space to share these like extremely uh, independent, <laughs> totally under the radar uh, visions and sometimes like low budget or no budget like digital video works. Uh, I guess for me, um, that was an ex- extremely exciting time, which some of that spirit really lives on. And a lot of those filmmakers have gone on to bigger and better and sometimes more commercial things. Uh, but of course, it's easy to feel, you know, a bit nostalgic for some of those moments where it felt like it was all really just kind of bubbling under the surface. Thank you for that, Samantha. Um, yeah, so I guess moving on to the next uh, question. Um, do you do you guys think that Chinese film gets the recognition that it deserves outside of China? Um, and uh, why or why now? Uh, so, Stanley, uh, do you want to that question up? Yeah, uh, first of all, like, uh, I'm wondering how we identify Chinese film. Is it made in China or speak Chinese or funded by Chinese uh, sector or like the cultural uh, Chinese etc. So, uh, speaking of Sinophone in Chinese study, it's a way broader spectrum than when we mention Chinese literature, right? So we have to draw a line first. And secondly, I think if we take it like Chinese film, which was produced in China and funded and directed by Chinese people, I think uh, in general it gains uh, appropriate recognition uh, considering its market size and population. Um, but I will say that like uh, recently the Chinese government, especially the uh, propaganda in the world, they underlined to improve the artistic quality of the uh, mainstream uh, films. So I think we uh, actually ring a bell like uh, the, the government really realized that even you uh, uh, leveraging like films as some kind of soft power, the, the artistic quality is crucial here. So I think, <laughs> and to me, it's not so many uh, Chinese films worth watching in the cinema. Uh, I have to be very uh, honest. So I rather like stay at home and watch some uh, other films like uh, European experimental films, etc. So I think there's still a long way to go. Yeah, that's my opinion. Thanks. Um, yeah, I suppose when, when within this conversation, maybe when we define Chinese film, maybe we're talking about a film that is uh, made and produced within the mainland. Uh, but yeah, also open to interpretation, I think. But, um, uh, Michael, same question. How do you feel that Chinese film gets the recognition that it deserves outside of China? Well, you know, as someone who spent my whole career trying to promote Chinese language cinema, teaching it, writing about it, of course, I hope to expand its influence and uh, I hope it can get more inf- it more impact globally. At the same time, I think we have to put it in perspective. Uh, a lot of Chinese viewers will ask me, how come more Americans don't watch Chinese films and these kind of you know general questions? The reality is it's not just about China. Uh, America, at least as a market, is very inward looking, very monolingual, and very resistant to non-Hollywood forms of cinematic entertainment. And so it's not just China that isn't getting a good foothold in the U.S. box office. It's virtually every other foreign language cinema. In fact, China has fared fairly well when you think about the top grossing box office hit in the history of American cinema, even today, is still Crouching Tiger and Dragon, a record from 21 years ago that still hasn't been surpassed. And that's a Chinese language film. And so I think, uh, and and think of that there there is a good crop of Chinese A-list actors who have successfully made the voyage into 
Hollywood uh, as actors, as directors, as um, you know, cin uh, cinematographers, art designers. And so I think there has been quite an impact, but the, the real the real elephant in the room is the fact that Hollywood is really the exception. It's the one industry that does have legs globally and is able to almost seamlessly travel and traverse boundaries, global boundaries, linguistic boundaries, and reach audiences all over the world. And there really isn't any other global industry that's been able to duplicate that kind of a success. And, uh, and so right now, I think we're facing a lot of other challenges in terms of China breaking into more global markets with a few years ago, all the film is now under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Publicity, uh, AKA Ministry of Propaganda. And that's resulted in more and more films like My Country, My People, all the, you know, or even going back further, you know, founding of the Republic and, you know, Wolf Warrior Two, And these are the kind of films that are going to have a lot of trouble reaching, resonating with global audiences. Um, I don't know if that really matters because these are films, which what's so remarkable about them is that these are films that can reach the pretty close to the billion dollar club. Uh, that is, they can bring in box office revenues of you know, 600 million, 800 million dollars, and they could do it on a fraction of the budget that Hollywood needs to produce those kind of films, and they can do it with one market, the Chinese market. Whereas the American Hollywood counterpart, like Avengers or, you know, I don't know, all these superhero movies, these are films with massive bloated budgets that are, they need that global market to break even and to make a profit. And China's been able to perfect this new model of combining entertainment cinema with propaganda cinema, works like Wolf Warrior 2, and they only need one market, and they can do very good business at the same time. And so I think there's been a real period of reflection and rethinking of what it means to make a global Chinese film over the last couple of years, and whether it's even necessary. I mean, several years ago, the big thrust was send Chinese films, send Chinese culture out to the world. You don't hear those slogans so much these days. And I think we're in a much more inward looking place. Um, thanks for that, Michael. Yeah, I think that is a really good, really good point that um, Chinese film, uh, the, the kind of major Chinese films that we've seen over the past few years um, really have performed incredibly in China. And it almost becomes a case of like, uh, do these films need to travel to other countries? Um, Samantha, uh, same question. Does, uh, does Chinese film get the recognition it deserves outside of China? And why or why not? Um, um, yeah, well, I think that uh, Stanley and Michael have good, great responses to this already. Um, I think the only thing I would really, I, mean, I think, you know, do I wish, uh, like, would it, would it be great to have even more kind of, uh, well, for one, would it be great if Americans watch, were more open to watching more films and TV with subtitles? Like, yes. <laughs> um, I think, uh, but that's not a unique problem to the reception and kind of embrace of, of Chinese cinema that applies to every every other language, cinema or uh, entertainment product. Um, I think just one other, and I think to the point of it doesn't matter as much anymore, um, and clearly I, financially, um, does not. Um, I do think one other ingredient that uh, has, you know, always, I, I think at least for some other regional cinemas, like uh, regional East Asian cinemas, like Japan and Korea, um, that for a long time perhaps broke through, you know, at least among a kind of even more like cult viewership in America and Europe and other places that were not uh, speaking those languages um, and kind of in like the midnight movie circuit, I think that there was a certain moment where a lot more genre cinema and pulp uh, cinema and, you know, uh, horror, thrillers, um, hard-boiled crime, zombie movies, monster movies, uh, which have always had a, you know, great tradition in a lot of spaces, and also Hong Kong um, as its own case. Um, I think that because Chinese cinema for export, or at least potential export for so long, was, you know, largely art house, um, and then also uh, then turning to a kind of more mainstream pop filmmaking, but but heavily with other 
you know, ambitions and genres <laughs> centered such as more patriotic fair. Um, I think that category has always been a little bit uh, like underdeveloped um, for you know a number of reasons we could all get into. Um, but I think that that's something that was always maybe missing that, that could have helped to get a certain kind of maybe more almost become the Trojan horse to get more Chinese filmmakers works to a more pop audience and kind of uh, easier mode of, of um, breaking through um, that, that did not happen. Um, and that now, now I think that even some of these genre directions that, that can be explored, even let's just say with sort of tri- crime stories and kind of you know, noirs, um, which I think are wonderful, some really great recent ones. Um, but, but again, I think it just, at the moment where some of this stuff has become more easy to do um, becomes less important uh, given the strength of the domestic film market. So. Thank you, Samantha. These are some wonderful insights. Um, uh, and uh, I just want to reset the room really quickly. Uh, welcome, everyone. This conversation is being hosted by Radii, a digital platform about modern China uh, and uh, youth culture and anything that's related to the creativity that's emerging uh, from from China today. Please click on the bios of our amazing um, ex- film experts uh, here. Uh, in today's panel, and also, um, you know, learn more about Radii uh, by looking at the bios of um, Jake Newby, Mavis Lee, Brian Wong, Greg Young. One um, quick plug is uh, Radii has put together a whole anthology of 100 uh, films, uh, Chinese films, worth watching. So hope you will visit us at R-A-D-I-I-C-H-I-N-A dot com. Uh, so, um, we'll be opening up the floor uh, shortly after two more questions from, uh, from uh, Brian, our culture editor, and um, I'll, I'll get out of the way now. Please continue. Oh, yeah, one more thing. I wanted to come in here. If you would, we're going to be open up, opening up the floor maybe after one or two more questions. So if you'd like to go ahead and start putting your questions in your bio so we can coordinate, um, you know, the next speaker's. That would be great. If you are new to Clubhouse, um, please make sure that you have a bio and a profile pic so we know you. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Uh, that was Greg Young, our social media strategist. Uh, my name is Brian Rogan. I'm culture editor with Radii, uh, currently using Jake Newby's uh, Clubhouse account. So um, to move on to our next question, um, in 2020, China became the largest movie market in the world. Of course, uh, that's partly because of shutdowns that, that occurred globally with COVID-19. But at the same time, um, China, uh, China's cinema market suffered what is most popular movie season. Uh, Spring Festival essentially canceled for moviegoers. Um, when we look at how China's Cinema, cinema market has grown. Um, why, why do we think that Chinese people are more interested in being at the cinema? Um, so maybe Stanley, if you could kick this one out. Yeah, um, I I took my parents to watch Hi Mom, uh, directed by Jiali, this Spring Festival, and it was, was so packed and full of people, and they just love it. So I think uh, uh, mostly because of the nostalgia of the 80s, because there was the era when they were young and uh, and experiencing everything, uh, the huge change afterward. So uh, from an individual observation, I'll say it is because Chinese are lacking of like so-called collective entertainment and also family-based activities. So I, I think right now smartphones and uh, TikTok like uh, uh, application like uh, isolated everyone. So when there is a festival, like uh, you have to find a way as a family gathering ritual to connect everyone. It used to be the I think it's the CCTV Spring Festival Gala, but not anymore, uh, as we can see from the data. And so I think cinema, uh, yeah, definitely create this kind of atmospheres. You can laugh, you can cry, you can share this uh, emotions 
in a very uh, shut down environment. So I think it's quite unique and unreplaceable. So I think uh, that's the basic or fundamental emotional demands, which everyone really feel it uh, like urgently needed uh, after the COVID time because everyone was shut down and everyone couldn't have this kind of uh, real conversation and face to face gatherings. So I think cinema become a perfect uh, uh, place, space, uh, scenario to connect, uh, to reconnect with your friends and lovers and, and, and families. So that's my thought. Thanks for that. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, a movie you mentioned, Hi Mom, was a phenomenon at the box office over Spring Festival. Um, actually, the director of that uh, film, Jia Ling, uh, she became the second highest grossing female director ever um, because of that movie. Um, so, uh, moving on, Samantha, just uh, with that question, why do you think that uh, Chinese people are more interested in being at the cinema? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Stanley really touched on it, but I think I think just uh, to do with the different, you know, kind of er, like layout of social space and social life in in much of China, um, and I think the, the very fact of you know, I, I think it'd be actually very interesting. I don't know the numbers on this, but to see the um, kind of numbers, the, the statistics of the building and the acceleration of uh, development of movie of cinemas and cinema screens alongside like shopping mall development. Um, I, I think that, you know, the kind of urbanist uh, or former urban researcher in me also just looks to the kind of like physical, infrastructural and kind of uh, um, uh, economic reasons behind this that like, which is not to say, obviously it's not like building a whole bunch of cinemas where nobody came, uh, you know, build them and they will come. I think but the, the, the rapid acceleration of at least the expansion of screens um, is driven by a lot of factors. But in general, also the need and the excitement and the embrace of physical spaces, um, even you know, which of course COVID interrupted um, in so much of of, of mainland China, but and, and the world um, coming back to life faster in China might have also um, you know just driven more of, a, of an embrace to take advantage of a physical public space, um, you know, and the, the kind of different escape that that creates from, from daily life. Um, I, think, I think for so many different reasons, like uh, so many American cities and rural places, um, physical locations such as shopping malls, um, uh, cinemas, um, other types of gathering spaces have just you know, really, even before the pandemic, um, we're on a downward slide. Um, so I think there's a lot of factors involved with that, but certainly a love for movies is part of it. But I think it's also, you know, kind of part of a, of a, of a greater ecosystem of kind of communal public activities that are just really um, needed to fulfill a really important function um, in Chinese cities and in, um, you know, more rural spaces as well. Thanks for that, Samantha. Um, and for Michael, uh, just, yeah, t same question in terms of like, I suppose if we think about holiday times like Spring Festival or the October holiday, why are, why are Chinese people uh, wanting to go and be at the cinema during these times? You know, I, I mean, on a very basic level, what's the old saying, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder and cinema was taken away from people in China for close to six months due to COVID-19. And I think people long for that intimacy to be with other individuals in a common space and enjoy that collective journey that film takes us on. It's not just China, I think all around the world, countries are longing for these collective experiences, whether it be in a cinema or just you know getting together with friends. And China was much more effective at handling the COVID-19 outbreak than a lot of other Western countries. And so they were able to open back up more quickly. And I think that brought people back to the cinema. Of course, there's the, the old factors that, you know, people are have more disposable income. Um, th there's also less commonly discussed factors, I think, that contributed to the drive in uh, box office. I think a 
conflicts, such as this is also taking place during the height of this Cold War with the U.S. and China, and you also see a stunning rise in kind of uh, neo-nationalist type thinking among, especially kind of post-90s generation in China. And they're all very cognizant of the fact that U.S. has been, you know, the the number one at the global box office for all of eternity. And this is their chance to really make a statement and make China the number one global box office. And I think that certainly drove not only a lot of audiences back to the theater, but also drove them to watch Chinese films as opposed to Hollywood imports. I mean, there's been a lot talked about how Hollywood films during this period, like Wonder Woman 1984, underperformed in the Chinese market. And part of that might have to do with the quality of the films, but I think a large part of it has to do with this rise in nationalist sentiment, which really makes Chinese audiences want to support their own local productions. Uh, another facet here is that we all know that censorship is a thing in China. And during the pandemic, it actually played a really interesting role that I don't think anyone could have anticipated. Uh, and so what was that? Well, there were a couple of films that had been banned over the last two or three years, films like 800 uh, by Guan Wu and also Johnny Lowe's One Second. And these had been tabled for some time, well over a year in both of these cases. And because production was shut down for you know, nearly half a year in China, there was a lack of product to get into the Chinese market. And, but here was where censorship came in. There happened to be this backlog of films that had been in limbo or been shelved. And so those were taken off the shelf and plugged into theaters. And those are films that had built up a certain, you know, the audience had had a curiosity and had built up a certain um, buzz around them because they had been un unavailable for so long. And so I think that also helped rejuvenate the market to some degree. And so there's a lot of these different factors in play in terms of what pushed the box office over the edge. Uh, but number one, of course, is just simply China did a better job at handling COVID-19 and they were able to get production back on track and open theaters much more quickly and more efficiently than almost anywhere else in the world. Thank you, uh, Michael, for that answer. Um, just going to jump in and reset quickly. Uh, you are in the China Room. Uh, this room is hosted by Radii, a platform uh, dedicated to covering all things music, film, fashion, entertainment in modern China. Um, if you're enjoying the conversation, please make sure to follow the speakers on the stage uh, and um, hit the bell to stay notified when they appear in other rooms. This is a conversation about Chinese cinema and how we think it's going to affect the world. Um, after this next question, we're going to be inviting people onto the stage. So please uh, write your questions at the top line of your bios. Um, uh, so that we uh, can kind of uh, you know, line you guys all up. Uh, I see there's a few hands raised so far um, and uh, uh, look forward to the questions uh, from all of you and comments after this uh, final question from Brian. Uh, thanks for that, Brian. Um, so, yeah, my name is Brian Grogan. I'm cultural editor Radii, uh, currently using Jake Newby's account on Clubhouse. So, uh, final question. Um, so, Michael, you just kind of touched on uh, patriotic uh, movies uh, by, for example, Guan Hu, which is uh, the 800, and also uh, Guan Hu was uh, part of another project uh, called Sacrifice. Uh, which also had the um, director of The Wandering Irish, Frank Guo, uh, was also involved in that. Uh, with more of these uh, patriotic films coming out of China, how, which don't necessarily translate well for Western viewers, how likely is it that a, a major Chinese block blockbuster such as um, the 800 or sacrifice will find a word success um, so Samantha uh, I wonder if you could jump in on that one uh, I'm so sorry uh, for a second I, I it cut out for a second can you please repeat the last question <laughs> sorry about that sure um, so with major directors like such as Guan Hu and uh, Johnny Mo. Um, 
um, pushing their uh, films more towards patriotic uh, movies, yes. which don't necessarily translate well. So how easy is it? Is it how, how likely how do you think a film? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I would say challenging. Um, I think you know, based on what we've what we've seen so far, and um, for all the reasons I think my co-panelists have already mentioned, um, I, I think that's going to be a hard a hard thing to break through as a you know. But again, if if it is something that is very meaningful and successful and lucrative on the domestic box office, um, does it matter that it, it will not break through as widely? Um, I you know. Perhaps not, um, but I think it is a challenge um, to have uh, those films which have so many different kind of agendas um, built into them, um, and, and then kind of just a certain direction that for a specific purpose, um, it's much harder to to reach a global audience um, who, who maybe have that no even context for some of those same issues or emotional calls um, at all. So I think it's a challenge. And then. Um... I suppose when we when we think about films like Angels of Watch or An Elephant Sitting Still, which kind of uh, talk about social issues in China, and then also when we think about directors such as Diao Yinan, uh, Bi Gan, and Peng Tsen, who have, I think, enjoyed um, in recent years some increased uh, box out success in China. Um, can do we see films like this translating well to the audience um, and perhaps uh, gaining some award success? Uh, Michael, I wonder if you could answer that one. Oh, yeah, I think some of these uh, art house films do have global potential in the art house market. You know, not in a big commercial market, but. I mean, you can see a film like Elephant Sitting Still, you know, it got picked up by Criterion Collection and um, I'm part of a Facebook group of Criterion Collection fans and I just saw a thread a day or two ago about people raving about this film and Western viewers saying, it, you know, it's the most stunning film they've ever seen in their life. And so uh, I think there are works like that that do resonate, they do win awards, but it's a fairly limited market, uh, of course, but that's not, what a film like that does, you can't expect a four-hour uh, art house film to become a, you know, a global phenomenon. It just doesn't happen. Uh, there, there are cases where I think of Edward Young's E.E. in 2000, which played in Paris cinemas for six months, and and so you, you do have these these films that kind of break through a little bit, but it's it's they're they're not going to be a number one Hollywood you know, box office blockbuster, but they'll do what they do, which is resonate where well, they'll find the audiences they need to find, uh, sensitive viewers who are looking for not a popcorn film, but a film to make them reflect, maybe uncomfortable, maybe make them look at the world a slightly different way. That's what these films do. And I think they will find their audiences, but um, unfortunately, I think we're seeing less of those films coming out of China than we did during the heyday of the sixth generation, because so many of those uh, one, once upon a time maverick directors are so enticed by the lucrative uh, rewards that the box office can offer them that many of them have given up their experimental roots and just embraced commercial cinema. And it's hard to resist that when you look at the box office. And so more and more that's where filmmakers are gravitating to. And I think we are seeing less of the risk takers like uh, Hupo and uh, Elephant Sitting Still. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, and finally, for Stanley, uh, recently in Chinese cinema, we've seen, uh, I suppose, an increase in genre films under like movies such as animation, but also uh, in sci fi with the, with the massive. Success of The Wandering Earth uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so, how excited should we be about these uh, various strata of Chinese film? Yeah, to me, the uprising of sci fi as a genre 
fiction and movie, actually, it's a reflection of the ambition and anxiety of own technology and innovation as a state. So also the Hollywood sci-fi blockbusters, uh, they're so popular worldwide. So definitely ring a bell to those who care about the soft power, so to speak, uh, pretty much. So, but from the great success, uh, phenomenal uh, box office uh, of the Wandering Earth and the epic failure of the Shanghai Fortress. So we can all see the problems there could not be solved overnightly with the boost from the government. It's uh, so many factors there, like protection of intellectual property and, and talents, perfectionist and respect to the content itself and uh, production value on an industrial level, etc., etc. So they are all the bottlenecks to continuously producing sci-fi movie above average. So I would say, it's, uh, to me, as a science fiction writer, I'm happy to see that uh, a lot of like capital and film company have high interest in in sci-fi as a genre, but also I can see there's a lot of bubbles here because I did talk to many filmmakers, producers, and venture capitals, but, uh, you know, like people always chasing after the vibe, but not actually knowing what they are doing and what they want from the drama itself. So say it takes time. So we have to be patient and calm down and wait until the right moment to have the shots. That's my answer. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much uh, to our guests, uh, Michael, Samantha, and Stanley, for those answers. So uh, now we're going to begin opening up the floor. Um, that's right, Brian and Greg. Yep, thanks, Brian. Uh, just to do another quick reset, you are in the China Room. This room is hosted by Radii, or a digital platform uh, that covers everything from music, film, fashion, and uh, entertainment uh, in modern China today. Uh, and, you know, great conversation with all the, uh, the guests. Uh, please make sure to follow them all, all those on stage, uh, and also uh, join the uh, China Room uh, as we uh, continue this, this a um, really interesting conversation about uh, Chinese film and its impact on the international markets as well as the domestic uh, market uh, itself. So, uh, Greg, um, what are the uh, procedures here for the uh, for the questions? Hello, guys. Um, once again, thank you, Samantha, Michael, and Stanley, for joining us today. Your insight has um, been so great. Um, we're about to let people on the stage, so um, I just wanted to, you know, go through a few things with everyone. Basically, we'd like you to keep your questions to um, one minute. Uh, I know you guys probably have a lot of things that you'd like to talk to our speakers about, but let's keep it to one minute and then also maybe one question um, so that we can just keep things rolling. Um, Thanks again, and if you can put your um, questions in your bio so we can kind of, um, you know, get things prepared for our speakers, that would be great. Uh, the first person that we're going to invite on the stage is Christopher Lee. Um, he is, I'm just looking at your bio now, who are you, Christopher? Adjunct professor at Pepperdine, worked in China in media and film industry for six years. Okay, Christopher, if you'd like to get started. Yes, hello everybody. You can just call me Chris. Thanks for having me on the stage. This is a fantastic conversation. And interestingly, um, Brian, we had met at a party for Iron Pond in the Shanghai Film Festival in 2007. Oh my gosh, you have a great memory. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I, I love connecting with people and ideas. And um, Michael, I was on your call last week with UCLA where my undergrad was, and my good friend Kaiser was one of the speakers. So this is a very small world. I, I love um, having this conversation with you guys. Um, I love to connect with you guys off, offline as well. And basically, I just, I just want to 
give a little bit of perspective from so many of the things that have been mentioned. Um, I worked in strategy and business development with Marvel Entertainment uh, a couple of years ago, uh, working with Disney and everything, um, working on different franchises, uh, digital strategy, and also before that, I worked for six years in China where I was working on importing films into China from the U.S., like the first Twilight movie, a Nicolas Cage movie, Knowing. Uh, so I worked with uh, SARF and uh, the Censor Bureau, Wang Dian Zongji, and you know they report obviously, like you said, back into the State Council and uh, with the uh, Propaganda Department, and also worked on Chinese productions with some of the top filmmakers there, uh, like Founding of a Republic, the, the first real big commercially oriented uh, propaganda film uh, for all for what uh, it's worth, as well as the first commercial success romantic comedy called Go La La Go with Xu Jingwei. And then also with basically the Quentin Tarantino, the person pushing the envelope of this new wave uh, called, uh, uh, with, he started with Crazy Stone and then I worked with him on a film called No Man's, no Man's Land. And so this, this whole idea of creating a film for the purposes of going to getting an Oscar has been a conversation over the last 15 plus years. And what's interesting about that is that that in conjunction with censorship, which is definitely a real thing, and it's just one of, one of the rules of the game of playing in that field there, that it doesn't really, it doesn't lend itself to winning an Oscar. Compare that to Minari, which is the first, Asian film to be nominated uh, as the best picture in the uh, but made here in the United States. That I think is an interesting model because uh, if we think about South Korea and Samsung global brands. Uh, I've worked with different brands in China as well as um, in the U.S. and the ability to create without fear that you're going to have scenes uh, from your script or from your finished film on the cutting floor is really important. So it is a matter of time before something comes out, but the story needs to be authentic for what it is, and there has to be a window for relatability. So Minari is a good example. If you haven't seen it yet, it is quite interesting. And this this milieu that we're in right now, the zeitgeist of uh, people fearing Asia or China or um, blaming Asians for the coronavirus, it makes it so much more urgent to have these types of conversations. Uh, I love what uh, the whole team at Radii is doing to bridge that gap in a very, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way where we can have these conversations. So I love having this, uh, I love that we're having this conversation. I'd love to continue this if you have any other questions. Um, and we'll love to partner with everybody here. So thank you so much, this is Chris, and I am done speaking. Cool. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, while we're waiting for some other people to maybe submit some more questions, you guys, um, my friend Jonathan Papish, friend of the show, Jonathan Papish, who is based in New York right now, just had his first kid, um, could not stay up late to ask this question, but had, had one question for you guys. The question, I think, is like, you know, getting, getting to the meat of our conversation in general and he asks what will it take for mainstream chinese cinema to find a large audience outside the mainland um michael you kind of answered this question a little bit um but do you guys have some other comments well i'll just say that what we consider a mainstream chinese film or a hollywood film has transformed radically over the last decade or so and so I don't even know if there's such a thing anymore but of a pure mainland Chinese film or a pure Hollywood film, for that matter. Even look at Wolf Warrior 2, which was as Chinese a film as it comes, so it seems. But actually, it was borrowing Hollywood action genre model from the 80s, right? This kind of Sylvester Stallone type, Arnold Schwarzenegger type genre. You know, had Hollywood actors. Um, you like the antagonist and the love interest were both established Hollywood actors. The action choreographer was a Hollywood guy. He's the guy who did 
Captain America, Avengers, the composer is a Hollywood composer. And so the, the and then you look at, you know, um, apple pie Hollywood films as they come, and many of those have Chinese funding. You know, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation was Alibaba, uh, and it goes on. And, and, and this whole thing about winning an Oscar, 2018, best picture was Green Book. That was an Alibaba production, or at least in part funded by Alibaba. And so in that sense, China already won a best Oscar. Of course, it was a film with no Chinese actors and not set in America, but the the definition of what a Hollywood film is or what a Chinese film is, are, at least for the previous couple of years, was quite blurred. Now, because of the trade war, things are kind of going back to a more, uh, you know, the traditional <laughs> model a little bit. But, uh, and then, and then one, one other part of the puzzle that I'll just throw out there is for many years there had been a, a drive for Chinese artists to win a Nobel Prize, to win an Oscar, and it was almost a, a fixation. And I think over the last few years we've also seen kind of a nationalist sentiment kicking in, which is making a lot of Chinese artists and the public question the legitimacy of those global awards and creating their own alternatives to honor local productions. And you can see that with the decoupling of the Golden Horse Film Festival, with the creation of more local Chinese awards, the attacks against Chloe Zhao. And so I'm not sure if winning an Oscar means the same thing in China as it did 10 years ago um, because of how nationalist sentiment is responding to, to the West. I'll also, uh, Michael, thanks for sharing that. I'll also say that filmmaking in general is extremely different in process from how it is in the United States, especially when you talk about uh, studio level type of, or mainstream. And when we say that, there's it's it's a loaded question because does that mean by the budget? Do, are we talking about sci-fi? Are we talking about, you know, based off of the best-selling book? Uh, and... So essentially here in the United States with the studios, the studio calls the shots. The, the producer runs the production, and then the director wants it screenlit that runs the set. But then at the end of the day, the director can be fired. But in the United, in China, the director is the producer and the writer, and sometimes often brings the money. So they, essentially, the studios there are distributors and financiers in, in name, but then really, we talk about Guan Hu, right? It's not even all of those people that are the, at the forefront of directing. They're actually running the show from top to bottom. So that's a huge difference. And um, the the other thing is that when you have, when, uh, I believe it was Brian, you mentioned Wandering Earth. Uh, that film was huge because of the fact it was a bestseller already in, in uh, the, the book was already a bestseller of the series in China. But the United States hadn't quite uh, garnered the same popularity yet. But if you put that side by side with um, one of my friends, Roland Emery, one of his films, they're, they're simple, but they're logical and they flow straight through. Watering Earth, from a logic point of view, was a disaster. <laughs> you know, um, I think the, the books are amazing, but the film didn't necessarily make sense from a logical point of view, which is more of the Hollywood style of filmmaking. Excellent. I love those answers. Um, next up, we have Brian Goldberg. He's going to be asking a question. Brian Goldberg, I'm looking at your bio right now. Born and raised in New York. Fell in love with Jim Bing while studying in Beijing. I love Jim Bing, too. Um, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Hey, uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, I'm a long-time friend of uh, Brian Wong. He's live in Hong Kong. And, Good to uh, see you, Goldie. Hey, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, I spent uh, 13 years in Asia, based in uh, New York now. Um, and uh, but I, my master's in uh, at Columbia was in Hong Kong cinema, actually, and a lot of China cinema stuff. And classes with actually Gene Seamus back in the day when he was when the Crouching Tiger had just come out, um, and uh, you know, Richard Pena, and I was a big film buff. Back back then, and just uh, joining this little clubhouse chat is, uh, is bringing back a lot of uh, a lot of passions, I guess, that I uh, haven't been in touch with for a while. So thanks for hosting this uh, 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 this room. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, I, have to, I have to jump in and ask Brian, were you in James Seamus's Hong Kong cinema class in 2000 when Crouching Tiger came out? Because we may have been in the same class. Um, I was, and that, that's why you look so familiar, Michael. Um, wow. Yes, yes. I, I, that's that's what I, was, I know you. That's right. That's, that's right. right. It's, yes, small look at world. That. <laughs> Convergence, yeah. It's actually crazy because I, I, I got back in touch with James uh, recently. He's actually, I believe, he's writing the, the script now for. Uh, uh, so my partner's family is, in, uh, is the subject of Abacus, uh, Small Enough to Jail uh, documentary. It's an you know, Asian American film, Chinese American film about something that happened with the, with the bank here, uh, with their bank in, in, in New York. And James, I think, has been hired to, to write the, uh, a, Hollywood, um, a Hollywood version of that documentary that uh, was nominated for an Academy Award four years ago, three, four years ago. Uh, it was directed by uh, Steve James from uh, Hope Dreams. Uh, but that, that film's coming back into play a lot right now uh, with the Asian American situation with the, you know, stop Asian hate and all, the, all that, that stuff. It's, it's coming back into play. I think it had, I think it had a bit of a showing in, in China to some extent. Uh, and, you know, Asian American films in China, that kind of topic, I it, I'm actually, I guess, curious to know a little more about like what other Asian American focused films have, uh, how they've been received in China or, or looked at or perceived um, in the past or currently. Or anything on that topic coming up now uh, is that I don't know how that plays into the film scene in, in China really compared to like how big the domestic Chinese produced films are and themes are and like, how much they really care about. The Asian American thing, right? And it's a very different topic. But just curious, uh, your thoughts on that? Um, maybe, sorry, Brian. Could you maybe state your question once more for us? I was I was kind of um, trying to follow, but it's, it seems like a really complicated one. Could you maybe just state it once more for everyone? Yeah, sure. Just uh, in terms of any, like a- Asian American. Or Chinese American film topics uh, or film centered films in terms of their reception in China, how they have been received, uh, you know, negatively, positively, but they just not, not, not care that much because it's, it's, it's a very separate topic. The whole Asian American uh, genre the topic is just so maybe far not so related to what's happening in the domestic Chinese film industry these days in terms of. It, it, that's kind of my, my, my question. I've been you know, away from China now for six years out of the film sort of industry for, for a while. So I was just curious to see if there's any growing interest in, in, in that. And, and I guess in a, in a, relate, a related question to that would be, are there, given how the Chinese domestic film industry is growing so much and there's so much more funding going, so much more creativity coming out, so much accomplishments happening in the current Chinese domestic film industry, are there American film producers going, or international film producers going to China to get inspiration for how films are being made in China? This is like a second, a second question, very different from my first question, but you know, I mean, previously with the American film industry being, I guess, the leader of the film industry worldwide, and you'd have people from all over the world coming to America to study how films are made, how they're written, how they're produced, how they're inspired. Is there turning the turning the tables to some extent now, where people are going to China to get inspiration from from the Chinese film industry to to make better films back home in their own in their own countries? Sorry for the two very disparate questions. Feel free to answer either one. <laughs> um, that was great. Um, actually, um, Stanley, you're one of the you're actually maybe the only. Um, Chinese Chinese national on our panel today. Would you like to take this question? Um, yeah, uh, take one. Uh, I, I, I want to mention the failure uh, directed by Lulu Wang and, and casting included uh, Awafina. So was uh, uh, was in the cinema last year, I think, or or maybe nineteen. So 2019 in, in mainland China. So actually, it got very uh, 
bipolar uh, critiques of uh, internet and because I think there's uh, some uh, context uh, issues there because not everyone as a mass audience in China understand the real situation and authenticity there as a nation or Chinese America. So I think uh, for those who are well educated and with very sophisticated taste of our uh, RC uh, movies, they can totally get it and totally enjoy it. But somehow some of the mass of the YouTube blockbusters and popcorn uh, movies, they might uh, get lost in the cinema because they they were criticizing the, the, the actors, the plots, and even the story itself. It feels like a uh, uh, strange or uh, uh, distant uh, from them. So I think that, uh, that this kind of topic needs some very well translation there uh, between different uh, cultural uh, complex. And so I think, um, of course, Chinese people like uh, care about the Asian America and right now the hate crime happening uh, in, in, in the States. And of course, there's so many uh, uh, diverse uh, opinions and voices out there. But still, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to leverage uh, storytelling, uh, no matter like fiction or a movie or whatsoever uh, uh, mediums as a, as a kind of narrative to uh, resonate, to communicate with uh, people in different areas and from different perspectives and to kind of create some kind of a consensus. I think that's critical because now you can see the divergence is getting bigger and bigger and I couldn't foretell any uh, improvement uh, coming sooner. So I think uh, with storytelling actually is the best way to do so. So I'm actually myself thinking about writing something about uh, Asian America or Chinese American stories with the uh, jacket or cover of science fiction as well. So yeah, that's my very brief, brief uh, thinking. Thanks. Great, thank you, Stanley. Yeah, that was, that was a fantastic uh, answer. And I think sometimes we take for granted how just, um, you know, so much of the Asian American or Chinese American experience also needs to be translated back to those the China audiences because uh, there, there is still that disconnect. But what I think is, is particularly interesting is that uh, you mentioned the word storytelling and, and if, if there's any medium that can really bring people closer together to get that understanding, it's, it's film and storytelling. So I'm just going to reset the room quickly. Um, you know, you are in the China room uh, hosted by Radii, uh, a digital platform dedicated to telling stories from uh, China about uh, culture uh, and all the creative um, things happening here in this uh, modern China. Uh, we're lucky, we're very happy to have a very distinguished group of uh, guests speaking about China film. Uh, please make sure to follow everyone on the stage and join the uh, China Club room. So um, Greg, do we have um, a, another question in the audience? We sure do. Um, first of all, I'm sorry if my connection is poor. Can you guys Tell me really quickly if you can hear me. All good. We, we can hear you, Greg. Can I just jump in, um, Brian, Brian, did we just ask that question um, about sure. filmmakers going between the um, United States and China or elsewhere in China? So there have been the, probably the best known or most successful case of someone doing that outside of China going there is Randy Harlan, who's just completely recreated his career there. He did extremely well in the United States with his different films with the U.S. studios and then just moved. He's working full time there uh, now. Uh, the opposite has not really occurred uh, successfully, though there have been plenty of uh, programs, initiatives with the major studios, different 
Mesh was bringing some of the top filmmakers from China over to the U.S. where they were shadowing people, they were meeting with all the different executives and agents and agencies and going through workshops and everything. And then after weeks and months and even years of different pitch meetings and story meetings, uh, they decided beyond just the process uh, and way to develop and write stories being different and too difficult um, compared to how it is in China where, like Michael pointed out earlier, there is from the financial point of view and from a story point of view, why not just work in your playground where you you play you know how the rules go you you make the rules. Um, when Zhang Yimou made uh, the Great Wall, that was one of the attempts to make a Hollywood film, but it was not authentic. It was it, there wasn't an audience in the U.S. or China for that. So really, at the end of the day, what are those authentic stories? Does it have a market? And then is there a window, a bridge that can be made that's not just a token bridge, like, hey, let's put a Caucasian or, or, a, or an American or a white actor into this film just so they can cross over, or an Asian actor because it'll cross over. But does this person serve a purpose as a guide, as, as our, um, essentially as our, uh, our tour guide into the film versus just a token character? If I could also jump in on that, besides the issue of this, you know, these token gestures to reach out to other markets, uh, in response to Brian's original second question about are there American filmmakers going to China to soak up stories, to get inspiration, to be active in the market there, I, I'm going to give a kind of cynical answer that the Rennie Harlins are by far the minority, and most of the American filmmakers that are approaching the Chinese market it's purely from a market perspective. They see the money, they see the potential, but there's very little effort on their part to really reach out and learn the culture, learn the language, learn the, the nuances of Chinese storytelling and Chinese cinema history. And so most of these people, they can recite, you know, everything about the Chinese box office that's appeared in Hollywood Reporter and Variety over the last couple of months or couple of years, but you dig a little bit deeper and you ask them, you know, who is Lei Feng or who is, you know, Joe and Lai, and they just look at you dumbfounded. And there's absolutely nothing there to support their interest in, you know, Chinese cinema other than this very pragmatic, you know, look at the market. And so, unfortunately, I think that's a big challenge: is that um, people haven't been willing to really put in the time and effort to have that deep understanding and deep knowledge. Well, one day, uh, Mr. Bing and Lao Jing Jianbing are going to go back to China and do a little film journey, what's going to be called Journey to the East, instead of Journey to the West. So we're going to do our own little Jianbing discovery, a chili crisp discovery in China, and bring it back to America. I think it's a great uh, uh, future plan that we might, uh, might, might, might come upon one day. Uh, Brian Wong, I'm going to need your help with that. Full circle, first full circle for the uh, Gen Bing, Brian Colbert. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you have to Gen Bing movie. <laughs> Shall we let um, Oma ask her question? Yeah, I was gonna say I'm just, I'm hungry just listening about this Gen Bing movie. Um, but we have another question. Uh, this one's from Alma Rafaela. She is based in I'm going to murder this Iloilo Il Il City, Philippines. Um, she's working in women's empowerment, and she's currently involved in the Relationship for Chamber of Industry. Sorry, International Relationship for Chamber of Industry. Um, Alma, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I actually DM Christopher. Christopher, the one with the green background, if I can ask. But this is just a question I had in mind. How, uh, this is this question is for Stanley uh, Chifang. Um, how receptive is China when it comes to foreign movies and foreign actresses, for that matter? Hi, Emma. Sorry again, I didn't catch up. Could you? Alma, could you please ask your question once more? All right, thank you. Thank you, Greg. How receptive is China when it comes to foreign movies and foreign uh, actor, actors and actresses? Um, that's a uh, uh, broad um, question. 
ocean. So very broad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I I try to figure out what you try to really ask is uh, like um, I don't know if there is any bias between like Chinese audience accepted the, the foreign actor and the actress, right? Oh, not not bias. Uh, for example, like when foreign movies like not particularly in the U.S., will be shown in China. How receptive foreign um, people in mainland China in accepting the movies that are not from China is to be, to be very specific. Yeah, but from any other countries all over the world, right? Not specifically. Right. From all over the world, not specifically U.S. How receptive are they when it comes to foreign movies? Outside yeah. from mainland China. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like uh, mostly depends on the story itself and also how they fit into the context. For example, like um, this one Indian movie, I couldn't really quite recall the name. It's about a dad like teaching her daughter, uh, his daughter, to do the wrestling. Uh, as a competition and finally won a champion in India. So that one was a huge success uh, in China because it relates to the, I think, relate to the uh, feelings of uh, Chinese family, like the connection, the bond between dad and daughter and the uh, eager to uh, win, to succeed in this over uh, competitive uh, society as an Asian, uh, East Asian country. So I think those uh, stories resonate well and translated well in Chinese market. And, and there's some others from Japan, from, I think it's from uh, Lebanon uh, last year, which was also one in uh, one of the uh, major uh, awards was doing uh, very well in the box office because it really resonated with people. I think Chinese audience, they have this kind of um, uh, higher demanding on emotional resonance. So it's, it's different from those who watch uh, Hollywood blockbusters back in the 90s were all after the uh, uh, visual effects, were all after the like popcorns, uh, big action scenes, or like big movie uh, stars. But now I think people mostly they try to uh, get touched uh, from inside because the reality is so exhausted. People want to feel some relief and feel some uh, emotional touch uh, in the cinema. So I think like right now that's the trend uh, because you, if you look into the Spring Festival, uh, cinema like Hi Mom is definitely one best uh, showcase. So I think in the future, like this kind of movie all around the world, they might have uh, huge potential and opportunities here to make a uh, uh, a great box office. So that's my answer. I hope it answers your questions. And oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. And by the way, I'm a fan of the House of Flying Daggers and uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's a, wow. It has been my childhood dream and watching wow. that is still very much uh, vivid in, to me. Uh, thank you. As long as the new, to recap what you said, as long as the theme is universal, China will be accepting. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, thanks, Dan. I'll say a couple other things also, um, because there, there are two big um, levels where that question can be addressed, which is from the public, the audience standpoint, and how they respond on things like Dopan and Weibo and everything, right, on social media as well as from the government standpoint because it has to go through the import the import bureau and uh back in in the early 90s when it first opened up there's only 10 films um 
And the people that were there can remember The Fugitive starring Harrison Ford was the first one. It was very well accepted. And then um, then you have films like Titanic. That one also uh, came out. That was huge and a huge part of uh, what happened there. But Star Wars never came out there during that time. So it wasn't, and still isn't really well accepted in China. Uh, meanwhile, now it's been up to uh, several years ago, the imports that uh, can come through every year are 34. Now, from the government standpoint, they don't give that all to the United States, though the U.S. studios would love for those spots all to go to them. It has to go to different countries. So they rotate through the different countries from year to year from for like Russia or Germany or England. And obviously, um, from the U.S., they want a good portion of them. Because the two, the two big questions that are asked from the government standpoint are, one, does this pass censorship? And two, is there a market for this? Because there are only 34 spots. And um, from the audience standpoint, that is decided after the film comes out. And sometimes the actors or the stories, they get eviscerated. So it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And like Stanley said, the Indian films are very well accepted um, from time to time. It's a neighboring country. There's another film called Three Idiots, Sang Sagwa, which is highly uh, welcomed over there because it had to do with why the the, the, di the the balancing between studies and your family and loyalty to your family versus what you really want to do in life. So it all depends on a, a case by case basis. But then there's definitely an openness to other cultures which is apparent uh, over there in, in China and through what you can see in social media. Great, thanks Chris for that, that insight and thank you Stanley for sharing the perspective. Um, uh, one quick um, uh, factoid uh, just related to this, you know, Hollywood considers China a big market for release nowadays. So looking back, um, based on our research, we, the first American movies ever shown in modern China, 1981, uh, from what I see here, were aired as part of the American Film Week around the country. I wonder if people have any guess what those films were. Uh, I'm going to just read. Yeah, anyone? <laughs> Go ahead, Oma. No, no, I was okay. not. Okay, so, so, so uh, Michael, uh, Samantha, Stanley, any ideas? 1981, American Film Week. I never guessed these. I, I'm just going to tell you that. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Well, are you referring to the, the event where Martin Scorsese and this team of American filmmakers visited Beijing and brought their films? Is that the event you're referring to? You know, I just have down here, it was 1981, and uh, it was supposedly the first kind of formal screening of uh, American films uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper way. But, yeah, I don't know if Martin Sorsese was there. But there, there were a yeah. few early exchanges where uh, I know Martin Sorsese went, I know actually some UCLA film faculty, I know Peter Wong, who later directed uh, the film A Great Wall, made some early trips to Beijing in the early 80s and brought uh, celluloid with them and showed wow. these films at the Beijing Film Academy at some public exhibitions and that was an incredibly important touchstone moment especially for some of those young fifth generation filmmakers who uh, you know were exposed to these new ideas and new films and had a big impact on them moving forward okay so <laughs> I, 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 I know that I'm at risk of being, you know, sort of corrected here, but I'll just, with all the experts in, in this panel, but I'll just say for this, uh, this event, the films were Singing in the Rain, Shane, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Snow White in the Seven Doors, and The Black Stallion. Um, so that was for many people the first taste of American film. Okay, I'm gonna get out of the way. That was supposed to be a reset, turned into something more. Uh, back to you, Greg. I love that, those um, Michael poking holes in your factoids, Brian. <laughs> that was quite, those were fairly under-researched. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I mean, not poking holes. I just wasn't, you know, I know that there were these actual exchanges with filmmakers going to China early on. Uh, I think the 
those screenings you mentioned are just a, it's just a different different thing. They're, they're, that, yeah. Hey guys! Oh, sorry. I'm I'm actually. Hey, hi. I'm Elaine. I'm the band strategy director of Radii. So I just wanted to chime in about that factoid. Um, oh, sorry. I'm like on a car in the middle of transport right now. But um, basically, uh, that was 1981, and the first specific U.S.-China exchange for um, entertainment and the arts. And so up until that point, the Chinese government hadn't allowed any American films into theaters in China. And the first five that they chose from, like, I think a wealth of 100 or so were the five films that uh, Brian mentioned because, you know, they, they had no um, themes that the Chinese government would find uh, too harsh for the Chinese people. Thanks, Elaine. So it wasn't the Radii Top 100 Chinese film list, I guess, they, they pulled from. Shoulda, woulda, coulda used our film list. Um, what if we what if we jump back onto our questions really quickly? This one is from Mavis, who is asking Michael and Stanley. Um, Mavis is of course in our room, but she is um, kind of preoccupied at the moment. Can't ask the question herself, so I'm standing in. The question. Um, for Stanley and Michael, both doing pivotal work in literary realm as well. Michael most recently translated Fong Fong's Wuhan Diary. I actually listened to the audiobook. There are definitely there are definitely similarities between how the West embraces and consumes Chinese movies and Chinese literature. The at times hesitation and reluctance, because Hollywood is as Michael said, often monolingual. Have you come across any Chinese fiction lately that you would like that you think would make awesome movies genre bending gems what are some chinese stories that you'd like to see take up a bigger space on the international silver screen thank you mavis do you want to go first stanley yep um okay thanks um oh oh thanks um uh, so i think there are tons of great stories out there um, across all the genres. Um, but specifically, I think science fiction and maybe thriller and, and maybe fantasy in a way. So could be a more translatable genre across cultures and different markets. So I think um, science fiction definitely uh, a great choice. So to me, I, th there's so many uh, books and stories I can recommend it, but uh, maybe I can right now just recommend myself because um, uh, Waste Time is a near future ecology thriller with technology. So, uh, we try to have this kind of collaboration with a British film company like six years ago, but it didn't turn out uh, good because a lot of things and also because of the pandemic. So right now we are really uh, actively seeking for the potential partners uh, because I think it's so relevant to what's happening right now. Uh, what Wiley, like uh, about the waste uh, problem and also about the, uh, uh, the sustainable issue. So, um, yeah, that's one uh, I want to say, but there's definitely a lot. I, I might make up a list uh, with uh, Ready Eye later. So, the most uh, uh, various uh, adapted uh, Chinese science fiction stories, etc., into the international one because you have to consider it. Um, what can be well accepted uh, as a foreigner, as a Westerner's uh, 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 perception? So, so there might be some ideology problems. So, I would not uh, underline a lot of like with very heavy cultural or very heavy. Uh, political uh, uh, elements there. So basically they are uh, mostly untranslatable. And I think science fiction as a genre, it has a lot of uh, common sense on a conceptual level, such as uh, uh, alien invasion, such as time traveling, etc., etc. So I think 
that's the perfect uh, genre, so so to speak. And, and, uh, back in the history is where is the most popular genre across the uh, world. So uh, Hollywood did it. So I think right now we should try to. So thanks. I'll, I'll just agree with Stanley that, that you know there's no shortage of incredibly creative Chinese stories and novels just waiting to be translated, waiting to be adapted. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, it's, there's so much out there, and in terms of genre, I'm going to completely agree that science fiction is wields great potential for adaptation into global markets, and just for common sense reasons, because you're, for a lot of these stories, you're not tied or bound to a specific geographic or linguistic space. These are stories that are taking place, you know, in this third space, whether it's an alien world or another planet or around a spaceship. And when you're in that realm, it's really irrelevant if the characters are speaking Chinese or Russian or English or French. And so it creates opportunities to kind of break through this kind of national cinema boundary and make truly global products that will cross over. And so I think there's, there's a great uh, potential for that in the future. And I think we just, you know, the world has only woken up to Chinese science fiction in the last you know, a decade or so, and if you just look what you know, Three Body Problem did for the genre in terms of it giving it a global market, I think there may be even greater things uh, ahead for Chinese fiction uh, in adaptation in terms of uh, film and television uh, potential down the road. Awesome. Samantha, do you have any stories that you'd like to add to that list? We haven't heard from you in a minute. Yeah, sure. I mean, just to agree with my two uh, co-panelists, and um, and I am currently working and starting to work on one. Um, so yeah, I think there's 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 a wealth, uh, an embarrassment of riches of, of Chinese stories. I, I think also, you know, it would be really wonderful to see even more works even just get translated to English um, from more readers. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, the, the kind of explosion of interest um, and, and publications in the past few years has been really exciting to see, and I hope that that keeps um, expanding. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, if anyone wants, I, the, the, the work I just actually finished, there's a really wonderful, if people want to check out, um, a new uh, anthology called That We, that we May Live, or it came out last year um, by a small press with some newly translated short works by different writers from across Hong Kong and China. Um, it was like, just blew my mind. Like, this has been sitting on my shelf for a, almost a year. Finally got to it, and I'm like, tons of these things I could see on the screen in really exciting ways. Um, there's just so many. Awesome. I'm always looking for things to add to my reading list that we may live in anthology. I will definitely check that out soon. Let's move on to the next question, though. Um, this is from Rinstown. Um, Rinstown, it looks like you are a student at UNC Chapel Hill, um, a Billie Eilish fan. I also, um, big Billie Eilish fan, love her. Um, what do you have to ask us? Hi there, thank you for bringing me up to stage. Um, my name is Yan I'm from China, currently studying in the US. I'm um, really interested in the topic and just joined this room. And I'm not sure whether my questions has been previously asked. Uh, but before that, I just want to quickly share how I wish uh, China could start importing foreign films just a little bit earlier so that Chinese audience will have the opportunity to follow the Star Wars series just like they did with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, my question is, I see the recent trend of Chinese movies focusing on either uh, politics-related nationalism or fan-based popcorn movies, uh, real storytelling movies like uh, the ones during the 90s and early 2000s, like those of Zhang Wen, Guo Zhang Yimou, it, it is becoming increasingly uh, rare. Uh, do you think it is still possible for China to bring back the earlier era of really awesome storytelling movies because China has such a great history and so many opportunities to to explore um, uh, instead of this current kind of fan economy driven and sometimes policy driven kind of movies? Thank you. I can uh, offer a quick answer. Um, 
you know, any, any market, there's ebbs and flows, there's trends that come and go right now. We definitely are, are in the eye of the storm in terms of these highly politicized films. I really hope it doesn't last and we, and we get the kind of films you just mentioned back, you know, more story driven, more artistically driven. Uh, I think it might be a couple of years before we get to that point. So, um, but I, these trends don't last forever. And so I'll just stop here and hand it over to my fellow panelists if they want to add anything. Anything to add to that, guys? Uh, hi, guys. Do you mind if I jump in? My name is Mike Adams. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I was uh, teaching screenwriting over in Shanghai for a couple of years in 19, uh, or 2017, 2018. One of the things we noticed uh, right away was there was a, an extreme amount of, uh, of control over what was happening right from the origin of stories, right from that level. Um, and uh, there were two things at play. One was, one was a real sense of uh, caution in terms of how uh, both the Chinese people and the Chinese government were presented. And the other was a real pushback against learning any sort of story structure. Um, and, and I can tell you, it wasn't the students who were pushing back. They were incredibly interested in learning story structure. It was coming from the industry side. So uh, as an educator in Shanghai, we were highly involved with getting the school involved with uh, productions that were going on in and around the area. And uh, what we found was the old guard just was not interested in anything that smacked of a Hollywood storytelling style. Even though, um, you know, the times have proven uh, quite strongly that uh, uh, a global story structure is universal. Um, except right now in China, it's, it's um, not quite hitting the mark and there's a real, um, a, a real need for a, a model of story structure that can work for the Chinese people in creating and, and be palatable to, uh, to audiences worldwide. And I think we identified that as the, the, the biggest problem that uh, Chinese filmmakers uh, faced. Um, the other is that um, the Chinese filmmaking industry just has no respect at all for writers. So even if, if you had writers that did have any story structure skills and were able to uh, come up with uh, some fantastic comment, which we absolutely saw every day, um, uh, quite often these, uh, these projects were taken over by old guard filmmakers and just destroyed in the making. So there, there's a learning curve to happen and there's an evolution to happen. What we saw, and I think what's happening still today, is that the younger filmmakers, the independent filmmakers, were the ones who were really digging in into story and uh, uh, usually writing their own works. And uh, those were the films that had heart and had uh, accessibility and, and empathy and uh, the keys that we look for in filmmaking and storytelling worldwide. Um, I hope that sheds a little light. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for having this conversation. It's fascinating and wonderful that you provide this platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and, and, and great to hear some insights from your perspective, someone who's on the ground interacting with uh, you know local writers, uh, creatives, and um, I think this has been a fantastic uh, conversation. Um, uh, today, you know, I, I did see Jonah Greenberg, you know, old friend from uh, the China days. I think he was head of CAA. Jonah, if you want to uh, join us and, and say a few words or uh, whatnot, please do raise your hand. Um, we're coming on the hour here, um, and uh, I just want to say we're in the, uh, the China Club, a uh, club that aims to open the world to China, being hosted by uh, Radii. Um, you know, we are a digital platform that uh, also shares stories from the heart of China's uh, youth culture and also, you know, covering entertainment, music, uh, film, uh, design, fashion, 
Um, we have a wonderful uh, anthology of 100 films um, that are you know, must-watches for anyone that wants to learn about China. Radii is www.radiichina.com. Uh, and um, do follow all the speakers here today, um, Michael, Samantha, and uh, Stanley. Yeah, okay, we have Jonah. Let's bring Jonah up um, and love to hear some insights from someone who was really in the middle of all that. Uh, uh, Thank you. And everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's, I, I don't know how much insight I have to share today. Uh, I'm just happy that you're, you're ha starting this dialogue. I was very happy to hear uh, Michael and Stanley and Samantha share all these perspectives. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, and get to know a lot of you here. Yes, if there was any one thing that I, I might want to add to the conversation, it, it, it's a meek observation and, and not a very strong one, but it's that the, the, the work of trying to bring Hollywood and China together is, is really difficult. And I have to say, it's, it's never been more difficult than it is today. And I think that a lot of people will be discouraged by that. But what I have seen in the past, you know, living and working in China is that the market, the Chinese film industry can really change fast and it can really surprise you. Uh, and the, the one example uh, that I might share with, with you all is the, is the movie Lost in Thailand, when at the time I had the honor of working with, with Xu Zhang and, and being his agent. And, Really, none of us expected that movie to be successful, so much so that, that we we kind of had very, very, you know, and to be, to be very honest, we did not have high hopes for the movie, but what, what then quickly appeared as an incredibly successful film actually was an incredibly large shift in the market, which happened almost, well, without anyone even anticipating it, and that was the rise of of you know homegrown Chinese films all of a sudden performing in huge numbers and and I guess what I learned from that or what I took away from that was that the elusive co-production that we've all been you know going after and, and there's been so many uh, near misses and, and and some also not so near misses and some big big you know disaster train wrecks but it, it will happen eventually and and it will happen not just once, but it will it will become a very very fertile market. That is, you know, a, a Chinese movie that is that is more than just a Chinese movie. It's a global movie, uh, and and but it, it may take two or three years, uh, but it will happen. And <laughs> that's my my little chicken soup for the day. Um, and don't don't lose hope. This is all I would say. That's uh, fantastic, John. Uh, that's that's a really uh, you know positive note to end on for today's conversation. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. It's great to reconnect. I think today's uh, uh, session was almost like a reunion of sorts. So many old friends coming back together, and, and amazing we could do this on Clubhouse. Um, I think we're we're at the top. We're we're at the top of the hour now, or at the end of the hour, so to speak. Um, and. I just want to say thank you again to all of our guests, um, Samantha, Michael, Stanley, for you know taking the time to share your, your thoughts, your insights. Uh, Brian uh, Grogan, our, our, our culture editor, thank you for you know, pulling everyone together, uh, and thank you to the Radii team. Um, so once again, uh, please do uh, you know follow this uh, club, uh, the China Club, uh, you know. Follow all the speakers. Check out Radii and uh, Greg. Uh, is that a wrap? Yes, it is. We'll close up this room in two minutes. Mavis, would you like to cue us out? <laughs>